this computer. Yeah, and now you get a little warning saying, did you know that Big Brother is watching you? <laughs> it's <clears throat> quite an age we live in. Good, so uh, we'll, we'll get started and, and uh, you know, people will, will meander in and out, uh, which is fine. Uh, it's all good. Let me just get this out of the way, my close, my participants. Good, so yeah, um, we did our Valentine's. So we had our, our, our meeting last, last month and we talked about broodstock conditioning and spawning. And uh, we did our Valentine's Day spawn uh, and we can talk about the, how that went with this, this kind of talk about larval rearing. And then uh, two weeks later, uh, no, three weeks later, we did our second spawn. So I think Barley, uh, who's East Hampton Shellfish Hatchery and Shell Works, and, and generally awesome guy, uh, except, he's, except he's on the South Fork, which I no longer ever go to, so. Lucky you. Yeah, he's on the other fork. Well, we'll get you. We'll get you over on the North Fork one day. And uh, he did a spawn the day after Valentine's Day, so we can compare notes. But basically, what happened with us, and we'll, we'll I'll cue up some pictures and and some little little things about larvae. Uh, I think my screen sharing is working. But basically, uh, the interesting thing about Barley and I is that. We're, we're really about the only folks in New York that grow so many different species. And when I say so many dis different species, you know, you can have a shellfish hatchery that grows oysters because they're an oyster company. Uh, you can certainly have a, a and that's, that's really a, the main thing that that most of the shellfish hatcheries in New York grow are oysters. Uh, one of the reasons being that clams in New York, we really don't have the same kind of clam aquaculture fishery as they have in places like New Jersey and, and certainly down south where, you know, you, you can run a hatchery, grow clam seed, and actually farm it under, you know, it, it, it's a lot of work because the, it, it requires, first of all, in, new, in, in our neck of the woods, it requires, among other things, about three years to get to market if you're lucky. You know, a, a wild, a native uh, cohog, the northern cohog, which is our, it's, I don't call them the hard shell clam because it's, not there's lots of hard shell clam, so it's 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 not a good term for our our cohog, the the northern cohog, and that's a you know in nature that's a five year to the one inch at the umbo to market clam. That's a long time to to get a clam. So if you're a farmer, uh, boy, talk about patience to get your product uh, going. And the the in in Florida. You can literally sew them up in a glorified gym bag and and like throw them on the ground and get clams out of the deal. Uh, and that just doesn't work where we are. It's cold and they want to burrow to for insulation value. I suppose they can, uh, you know, I've never had that much luck uh, trying to containerize clams to the overwinter well. Uh, and we get a cold, you know, you get these cold winters, you can get some pretty significant mortality. So we, there's, I'm not saying that there isn't a calling for clams, and there are certainly are shellfish hatcheries. Frank M. Flower and Son used to grow like 60 million clams for themselves a year, and they would plant a million clams per acre on their grounds and just keep rotating. So after five years, you know, every year you had a, a place to, to go clamming. Uh, and get product. But um, the reason why barley and Cornell grow so many species is a, a big mandate for our programs is to grow seed to just enhance the stocks for everybody to harvest. It's not, it's not really for uh, aquaculture harvest uh, as much as wild harvest. Have you, do you ever sell seed to, 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 to aquaculturists, clam seed? 
Clams, no. <clears throat> we'll we'll sell oyster if we have a huge surplus. But yeah, yeah, but I mean, clams, clams just aren't. I mean, and and that's not to say that I, I want to grow. I want to get my hands on a, a bunch of clam seed to give to SPAT members just so they can be Johnny and Janie clam seed and just go along and 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 seed the beds. I think that's that's important to do. And certainly for uh, East Hampton shellfish hatchery, uh, they put a lot of clams in the water. And, you know, you do that for as many years as, as both of our facilities have been running. And eventually you, you, uh, you get some pretty good results of people clamming. Uh, one, of the, one of the downfalls that's happened with Cornell, uh, I, I'm gonna call it a downfall when we got this big, big shellfish project uh, four years ago, they mandated that we not use notata clams. They wanted white clams. And so we used to use notata clams, which have the purple and white, uh, purple, purple uh, band, kind of banding. And you could really tell uh, how, your, how your plantings were doing uh, compared to maybe wild set. And, uh, and they actually are much, I think they're much hardier in the, in the nursery as far as we seem to see a lot of mortality in native white clam uh, aquaculture seed than we do in notatas. Maybe it's just selective breeding, but uh, there used to be a time when I, when I would plant clam seed and in this one particular spot and notata clams, which are these marked clams, are a na are they are native, but it's a it's kind of a, a rare and uh, it, it it's not a dominant uh, gene for this color morph. But you can very quickly get all of your clams to have the color morph through selective breeding, and so in nature they say two percent have the notata mark. Now, not necessarily the notata mark but the notata genetics. So the genotype, what's inside the clam can have 2% of this color allele on its chromosomes. So you might not see it. The phenotype is what you see. And somewhere along the line, some people started finding these really bold notata clams and selectively bred them. So we can have 100% homozygous notata clams if we want them, which I think are really cool. Uh, and, and, and they're handy for a genetic marker for how your plantings are doing. Uh, so I used to go clamming after these plantings and I would get 98 notata and two white clams. So you, you can really see how, how well your plantings are doing when you're using notata. It's, it's, it's kind of striking. So, but what I was going to say is that we're going to kind of, when I stop meandering, come on, wake up. This is a talk about larvae, darn it. Uh, when we're growing larvae, because Barley and I are growing oysters, clams, and scallops, now Cornell's going to mess with rib mussels. I've grown uh, 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 steamer clams, uh, the Maya arenaria, and I've, I've grown uh, the surf clams, the uh, spicula solidisma, the, 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 the surf clams. So we've, we've, the technique for, for culturing all of these shellfish is, is very similar, but the larval cycles are slightly different time-wise, size-wise, and certainly next month we're going to talk about uh, setting metamor the metamorphic process, and and that's radically different with with all of the species. So, there wh what we're pretty much going to be talking about today are oysters, but uh, some of the differences are the indication that they're about getting ready to metamorphose. That, that there's some size differences and some visual differences that we're going to uh, talk about, uh, but. Uh, what happened with us with the Valentine's Day spawn is Valentine's Day was on a Monday. We spawned them on a Monday. We, again, we, uh, for folks that were here last month, we talked about, you know, what we use for broodstock. But uh, we used 
the fast growers of last year's stock. And I thought we were so cool until Barley told me, yeah, we've been doing that for years. Uh, so it kind of dusted me on that one. I thought we were so progressive and it turns out we were about four years behind the, the, the curve there. And, and we got uh, an even split of, of male and female. So we got uh, 11 uh, females and 11 males and uh, we ran our batch and we had a lot of larvae, about 50 million larvae, and we set set what uh, whatever we set. It's very hard to count post set until, <laughs> until you either buy yourself a pair of reading glasses and can pull out a one, millil one milliliter sample of really small seed and with your toothpick or whatnot, uh, count them. And, and get a, a total volume and get it's, it's a volumetric subsample and you and you count them and you can kind of get an idea. Uh, so I never count my oysters before they hatch, so to speak, but we got a, we got a nice run. We have some uh, yesterday I, I pulled an outlier out to see what our largest oyster was and it was five millimeter, which uh, which is pretty darn okay for being a month old. And uh, keep in mind that <clears throat> in a way, we're still in hatchery mode with our post set because I always think of hatchery mode as being, you still have to feed those sons of guns cultured microalgae. And so to me, anything that you have to feed cultured microalgae is still in the arena of the hatchery, not the nursery. When they go on ambient flowing seawater, that's the real nursery. So they're still on what we call static tanks. We fill them up every Monday, Wednesday, Friday after cleaning them. Uh, and we fill them up with tempered seawater. So uh, we're running them in the 70s and feed them cultured microalgae. Uh, we were running the tanks pretty warm, uh, almost to 80 and they were just eating us out of house and home and growing like mad just you could almost watch them grow they were growing so fast and and we can size them you know you say oh well how many yeah how, you you don't have a clue what you have well no we can you know we can count larvae is relatively easy to count uh post -sep is because and we'll talk about that in a moment how we count larvae so we when we say we have 50 million larvae, it's like, oh yeah, like you really, your eyes are so good, you can tell. No, I can never tell. People come in, they say, how many, how many is in there? Well, I don't know, I have to count them. I, I, I can't really visually look at a paint stain of larvae and say, oh yeah, that's a, that's a million, 1.2 million, but we can count them. And I'm, we're gonna show you how we, how we count them. But the, the counting process is based on a, homogeneous suspension of these things in the water so we can take a, a sample and post set doesn't work that way there you th then you literally have to get a volume of them and take a volumetric subsample and count it each each little critter and that gets that gets pretty hard until they grow to a size that let's say are bigger certainly than the head of a pin you know when they're ahead of a pin uh, you're using something to count them with, and invariably you're making them catapult <laughs> out of out of the thing. Pink, oh, that was one, but I don't know where it went. And they're underneath your fingernail and all this stuff, so they're kind of tough. But when they're five millimeter, they're definitely countable. Very easy, even when they're you know two millimeter, they're 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 easy to count. When they're eight hundred micron. I don't, I don't torture anybody to, to figure how, how big, how, how many there are in a volume. So we, we're not sure what we have, but I can guarantee you that we have at least 2 million, which covers all of the SPAT program. So we're in, we're in great shape for everyone to, now on that note, if you want to come and get your thousand oysters, uh, bring a shot glass because, you know, a thousand oysters are still only going to be, you know, Somebody came into the hatchery yesterday and, and, and when do we get, oh, when do we get our oysters? And I walked over to one of the set tanks and I took my finger and went, and I said, well, there, that's a thousand on my fingertip. 
uh, which I didn't know because I didn't count them, but it was definitely, you know, 8,000 or so on my fingertip. So you, you don't want them that, that small. Uh, I would say oysters will be ready for people to get in, in uh, mid-June, though. So that's early for us. Usually it's around the 4th of July. It might even be earlier than that if, you, if, you, if you're coming around and paying attention. So uh, let me see if I can share my screen uh, desktop. So does this, is that, is that picture on there? You see larvae, a picture of larvae? Okay, so. Yes. Goody, hey, it works. Thanks, Darcy. She's still, go she's gone. She went, she's on vacation in the Florida Keys. Hey, Barley, how was the F Florida Keys? Didn't you go to the Florida Keys? Yeah, it was awesome. Oh, Absolutely man. amazing. Okay, I don't want to know. Expectations. Oh, good. I don't want to know anymore because we were in snow. Uh, no, it's all good. I love yeah. it. I love it. So here's an egg. And actually, you know, in the field, and if you're looking under a microscope, if you see these little kind of white, uh, the flecks of light, really, it's the microscope light. That might be the size of sperm right there. And that might be sperm swimming around. If you look with a microscope and you look kind of closely, they look like little commas, black commas swimming around. And you want to make sure you do look under the scope because if you see your beautiful egg there and 60,000 commas around it, uh, you put way too much sperm in, in your bucket of eggs. Uh, Barley doesn't do this, by the way. We found out that Barley just is in his kitchen at the hatchery having donuts and coffee while they're all fertilizing on their own. Uh, it, it turns out that <laughs> we at Cornell make life way too difficult for ourselves, but we think we're being, you know, whatever, careful or something. I don't know. But uh, I learned a lot from the technique that Barley uses, which is spawn them in a mass tank, let them fertilize in a mass tank, drain the mat, collect everything, uh, in a probably an eight, uh, 18 or 27 micron sieve uh, to collect the egg? <clears throat> Not even. Just rinse them right out into a bucket. Really? Yeah. Rinse everything right out into a bucket, dump it in the conical. Gee, see come that. back the next day and do a water change. That's, well, that, that's, that's strikingly, uh, strikingly efficient. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't do that at all. We 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 cut, we we set up little beakers. We decant eggs. We put them in a bucket. We add the sperm. We stir it around. I mean, I don't know. There's Frankenstein, and then there's just buying the monster right off of the rack. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so so anyway, you here's the egg, and when you see this dot on it, this is this is what's called the polar body, and that pretty much tells you that the egg has been fertilized, which Barley assumes they definitely are because he doesn't care. He lurks in the morning and, and drains them down. We, we, uh, we, do, uh, we do monitor though. We do definitely, you know, take samples, look at them under the scope and see all this. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's, and, 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 and basically it must get boring because they always look like this. They, there's a nice round egg, nice polar body. If you wait long enough, and it's really, when I say long enough, it, it, it's, it's really not very long before the egg divides, you know, it, it, and divides again and divides again and divides again. This can happen from this egg to this cluster can take, you know, a couple, just a couple hours. And this here might be what's called the, at some point, it's called the morula. And I've, I've actually witnessed this once where you see this, this dividing egg start to actually gyrate. It'll, 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 it'll slowly just start spinning around. And if you waited long enough, because it, again, doesn't take very long, you get to the first larval stage, which is a trochophore that darts away, just flies off of the screen. These are very, very quick, uh, swimming. And now I don't know, I, I, I'm stuck in this kind of mindset that I was in when I was learning this in grad school. And I haven't really looked at some of the literature to prove that anything has changed. But my understanding is that the trochophore, this is a trochophore, is non-feeding, 
It doesn't eat yet when it's a trochophore. And it's positively phototactic, which means that it's kind of drawn to light. That's my understanding of a trochophore, which I like because both of those things make sense on a kind of evolutionary standpoint. This thing would then be the, the, the quick dispersal phase of this larvae, that they just go up into the water column where the currents might be running and they don't need to eat yet and they just kind of spread out. And that's important because if they hang out with mom and dad, like some offspring I know, uh, just an inside joke, okay, you know, uh, then, then the parents over time will suck their offspring in and eat them like in Greek mythology and, and spit them out uh, because shellfish are voracious filterers. They can definitely filter in, you know, a trochophore and render it kind of dead. So I'm not saying that that's why, you know, this is just the mechanism. Trochophore, very fast swimming. If it's positively phototactic, it doesn't matter. It's planktonic and it's cruising around and it's in this vast water column. But in another respect, everything wants to eat it. Little copepods, everything wants it. They're the popcorn. So, you know, that's why when an oyster spawns, it can give off 50 million eggs that so if you had 50 million fertilized eggs and 50 million trochophores trust me they don't they don't all make it if they did we would be living on the planet oyster yeah and then in it, and then overnight uh they will be on their first larval stage their second larval stage this straight hinge or de-hinged veliger larvae so this is a trochophore and a dehinge veliger. And this is a resting veliger. We'll, we'll see a picture of the vellum, which is a, 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 I call it a little hairy beret of an organ. It's, it's, it's like a little Hoover vacuum cleaner organ that allows it to feed and to move. So that's, that's egg to, in 24 hours, the second larval stage. How are we doing, Barley? You got the same thing, right? Anything you want to add to that? No, no. Uh, I just, I just wonder about the phototactic part. I wonder if, uh, you know, you said they're not feeding, but then if they're phototactic, when the time comes to feed, they're up at the surface where there's more food. I wonder if that's part of it too. It could, it could very well be, and they're not non-feeding for very long. So, I mean, yeah. even. I don't know if you do this, but if you if you have your if you have your eggs in the conical, do you put food in? Well, the truth of the matter is, you probably don't have to if you're draining them down uh, the the next morning. They might not be feeding, but I always put algae in the water overnight because some of them are going to be waking up or turning and being, hey, where's the food? You know, I came I came here for something to eat and and there's nothing here so you know it doesn't take very long before they start eating so that is an, another interesting thought is that they're up at the surface positive phototaxis is also where uh, good algae is going to be because algae being a photosynthesizing protist is using the light and so there's a, a certainly a photic zone where algae is going to be a lot better than uh, going down and, and, and losing light. So uh, let me see here, sharing screen. So uh, a new share, let me do a new share. There's, uh, let me close this one. What am I doing here? We close this one and see what we got. Oh, got all these things in my way. Let's see, what do we have here? Larva. Oh, a uh, diagram of the, here we go. Can you see that? Not yet. Uh, uh, there it is. Okay. So, so now what we have, let me close this. Is it still on there? It's showing? Yeah. Larval cycle. Okay. You seeing a little box? You seeing my whole desktop with all the yeah. bases in the back? You are? Yeah. 
Okay, so I don't want you to do that. How's that? Now, so you get, yeah. you get a male and a female oyster, egg and a sperm, they fertilize, they divide and become this trochophore. They're going to become this straight hinge, D hinge veliger. They're free swimming. So these are what are called, they're planktonic, but they're also kind of nectonic, meaning they're swimming in the water column, as opposed to later on, they're going to be benthic bottom on the bottom. So you've got this veliger larvae and it, and it rounds out. And anytime anybody comes into the hatchery and looks at larvae, they say, oh, are those clams? Because all of the species that we grow in the larval stage look like clams, like all the time. And it isn't any of them but the clam that ends up looking like the larvae did. Uh, they, they, an oyster changes from this clam looking larvae to an oyster. And I got a nice, I queued up a nice thing that's coming up in a minute to show you that. Uh, and scallops, remarkably different post set. It's just the clam always looks like the larvae. They just, it's kind of funny that way. And uh, what do we got here? Uh, I'm gonna get this out of my way. Uh, and then, so from this stage, from egg to now you've got what's called an eye. Here's an eye spot and a foot and a vellum. So you've got an eyed peda veliger. Eye spot, foot, ped, veliger, an eyed peda veliger. And that's what one of the kind of cues for us to get ready for it to undergo metamorphosis. And this arrow here is the April lecture. So we're not going to do too many spoilers here. We're just going to go through a little bit more in detail from this uh, D hinge veliger to this peta veliger. And they, all of these, all of these, uh, let's see, what do I have here? Let me get, find my, how do I turn this off now? Escape, ah, there it is. Okay, now let me see if I can do a new share. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second, okay. So, uh, what happened with us on the uh, on the Valentine's Day spawn is we went from uh, our D hinge veliger, our spawn next day, to uh, an eyed peta veliger in eleven days which is pretty darn okay for oysters. So we spawned them on a Monday. Uh, they went through a week. So the following Monday, and they, uh, uh, a lot of them set on that Friday, which is pretty good. Normally it's about two weeks. So, you know, it's like you spawn them on a Monday, you probably be taking most of them out uh, two Mondays later. That, that was that's what was the temperature? We keep them at 28 degrees. So eight, yeah. you know, run them hot. We run them hot. And there's a caveat there. So they grow, if you've got good algae, and by the way, we're feeding them a mixture. They, they, they get a, a varied diet as, they, as they're growing older. So one day old larvae, we're just giving them the tiny brown algae, isochrysis, T iso, or, and, and, and pavlova. They're about two, two micron algaes. They're called brown naked flagellates. They've got a little, a little flagella on them. Uh, they're they're uh, flagellates, that, so as opposed to something larger like a tetracelmus is a chlorophyte. You have some diatoms, like, uh, well, different diatoms that we have. And so they're just eating those browns for pretty much the first week. As they get to be about a hundred plus microns, we can add some diatoms to them. And as they're going really to, to right about the end, pet we might 
also be able to give them, you know, a, a taste of this tetracelmus, the green, which is quite a large cell. And so, and what's, a, what's remarkable, uh, remarkable about algae, there's this little uh, kind of a guideline that, that you know, one of the, one of the uh, aquaculture uh, sites put out of the number of cells of ISO that each larvae eats per day per size. It's a little chart. You've seen that chart, right, Barley? It, 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 you know, it's a little kind of interesting guideline. When they're one day old, they're eating, I believe it's 2,400 ISO cells each a day. And that sounds like a lot. It's, it, you know, they're tiny cells, but 24. So what's remarkable about, you know, everybody knows how good of a filter shellfish are. And they're always talking about, oh, I don't, an oyster filters, blah, 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 gallons a day. But what a lot of people don't realize is that these things are doing this from day one. You know, they're filtering from day one. Uh, not a voracious amount, but the fact that they're eating 2,400 cells when they're, you know, really not the head of a pin, they're the, just barely the point of the pin. And what's remarkable to me is when they reach the pedibelager stage, they're eating 72,000 cells a day, which is a big, big jump. I mean, that's like three times an order of not three orders of magnitude, but an order to order of magnitude times three. So uh, it's a it's a lot of cells, and and we know that when you're feeding them, and if you're tight on algae, you you feel it. If you've got plenty of algae, you don't really care. It's just kind of striking. And but you, what's important is you have to know to feed them more as they're getting bigger. I mean, you can't just feed them the same thing. Uh, from day one to day 14, it, it really every day ran, is a different amount. And that's, by the way, why a lot of these uh, uh, of the hatcheries uh, count their algal cells so they know what, you know, what they're feeding. It's a ration. Uh, I suppose I shouldn't even ask Barley because I know he must do, just do it by eye. <laughs> Because that's how I do. I, you know, I wall of metrics is a good science to me. But you, you no, count. I do counts. Yeah, you do count. Yeah, do of count. course you do. Because because you know algae cells, algae growth is so dynamic. I mean, you 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 can think you're, you know, and and now with this, uh, barley's got a sea cap, which is a sea salter continuous algae culture machine. You really can grow some nice dense, dense algae. We've got these photobioreactors that grow the algae like a, a, an order of magnitude denser. So instead of a million cells per milliliter, it's like 10 million cells per milliliter. And you have to know these things because you can easily overfeed uh, something. Uh, so, you know, uh, it, 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 it's good to... Uh, to know what you're feeding and, and, and give them the proper ration. So they're marching up, they're marching up. And then uh, we set our, our first batch uh, on that Friday. So that was 11, so it was eight, nine, 10, 11, 12-ish, 11, 12-ish days uh, to, to and, and the second batch did exactly the same thing. So with our feed, with our temperature, we're running our larval cycle from spawn date to, to set date in 12 days, which is pretty darn okay. Uh, you know, it, if you go 14 days, that's certainly not uh, uh, an issue. If it took 21 days, I think in, in, the, in nature, it can take upwards of 21 days because they're not getting this ideal treatment that the hatchery is getting. They're not getting, the temperature isn't up that high. And the food might be, but you know, temperature plays a, a, a big role in 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 that in in that. Uh. Now, again, we didn't talk about. Uh, I'm going to go back on some of these larval things to 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 explain a couple other things in a minute. But clams usually clams and scallops usually 
are running uh, even less time than that. So uh, I'm used to clams being about 10 days and scallops being around, you know, eight to 10 days in the larval cycle. So it's a little quicker in there. And so you have to be ready for all these things. Uh, but oysters usually, now I don't know if uh, barley has ever messed with uh, sea scallops. I haven't. But I'm told that sea scallops are 35 days in the larval cycle wow. and that you got to keep them cool. Now, you know, somebody asked me, oh, can you get some sea scallops and play around with them? Well, if they're 35 days in the larval cycle, no, I'm not going to play around with them because that's like crazy. And I don't know of any other, you know, species that and maybe that's in the wild. Maybe you can ramp that up using temperature, but they're, they're kind of a colder tolerant species and they want things cooler. So, you know, that, that's like, that's crazy. I'm not sure what we're, we're supposed to be messing around with rib muscles. And I don't even know what the timing is on rib muscles for, for the larval cycle. So uh, there's that. Let me, uh, let me share my screen with another thing here. Uh, move, what do I have here? Uh, I'm still learning all this stuff. I'm trying to move my, ah, there we go. And I move this out of the way. And so I can see what I'm trying to share. Uh, what is this? Oh, okay. Uh, I should have done this. Um, can you see that? Okay. Basically, oh, what did I do? Can you see that picture? You see that picture? Yeah, I can't. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, here's our hatchery. These are larval rearing conicals. Uh, we have in our hatchery, 100 gallon and 200 gallon conicals. They do have a, a cone base. These these big ones really don't have the same kind of cone. I, these are tough. I'm going to tell you something that happened to me today with these, and it happened last year with these 200 gallon uh, kind of shallow cone. These have a nice deep cone and 100 gallon. These are beautiful conicals. I call these, it, it, you know, I'm used to 100 gallon conicals, 400 liter conicals. I call them 100 gallon conicals. And I'm used to running these uh, so that I can, uh, you know, know how many larvae per hundred gallons. So these, when I, when I've been dividing my larvae up, I have to count these as two. So I call these conical equivalents. If I'm putting, if I'm putting 2 million larvae per conical equivalent, this would get 2 million larvae. This would get 4 million. It's a little much of a pain, but that's how I've been doing it. And it, it's, it works out okay. We actually have a huge amount of these. So the, the two batches that I ran, uh, I ran uh, 26 conical equivalents, which is pretty good. Uh, that, that's, that gives you a, a, lot of, a lot of volume. So if you're running them at and I was really running them at about 2 million per 100 gallons. So I was running 50 million uh, larvae in these 25, 26 conicals. And I have a siphon tube. A lot of people don't use a siphon tube. They just, these conicals have a rubber stopper with an airline at the bottom. And it keeps the flow of, of liquid with air uh, circulating. And it also, by the way, uh, keeps the, there's a heater in here that's maintaining temperature. And it, so it keeps the heated water circulating, the algae circulating, the larvae circulating, the water circulating uh, with air bubbles going, there's a little boi boiling in there. And uh, you can just pull the cork on, here's a sieve that's a, a 40 micron sieve uh, for small larvae. You can I use a 75 micron sieve for larger larvae. And I throw a siphon tube in there just to keep the rumbling. But 
you know, I, I started fooling around. You don't really have to do that. I have a what's called a breaker box. It's just a little contractor's tote so that the water comes up. It's not just drying, it blowing down onto the screen. And I collect that and then pull the cork out. And what we're doing is collecting all of the swimming larvae all the way down into a sieve and collect all the larvae. And for the first bunch of drain downs, I think I, I, I can... Uh, stop sharing that picture and maybe get another picture that was the larval rearing conical what's this one that's the same picture uh so let me share that uh share screen and make that picture bigger so you know i got the bucket here i got my screen i wash all the larvae this has got a screen on the but it's a piece of of, of, of 20, 12 inch PVC with a little foot, a little leg on it. And it's got the screen 40 micron. Don't forget to label it. Here's 40, it says 40 on it. You gotta know what the screen is so you don't just run your larvae right through the wrong size screen and lose everything. So I collect everything in a bucket. I, I take everything down. You can't see I, your screen. Can no, I didn't, I didn't show oh, okay. that. I didn't show the screen. I should have. I, oh, I should have. I should have. Uh, I should have taken a picture of uh, of the screen. Uh, let me. Maybe I have one here. What's this? That's the same picture. Oh, okay. Here we go. Uh, am I still sharing? Did you see that picture? Oh, no. I Okay, I have to do a new, hold on, I have to do a new share, new share, I'm learning all these tricks, share screen, and the picture here, now you got it? No. Yes? No. No, you don't see that? Huh, hold on, share screen. Oh, how about that? Got it. Okay, so this is a this is a actually a, a sieve that we use, but it's the same concept. A piece of PVC. This happens to be fume duct, and here's a screen. So all of this stuff here, that's all larvae. Here's a big clump of larvae. Here's a big. I just kind of tilted this to take the picture. And, and this in the middle is a, is a screen. And, you know, I always, I always talk about sieves. You know, when you're a kid, you get the, the different sieves that you go on the beach with, a little yellow one, a little blue one, a little green one, and they, it goes from coarse to fine. Uh, we, we have the best collection of, of sieves. I mean, I'm a little kid. It 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 because I never got given a sieve for the beach. My parents didn't give me that. Probably because I think my dad lost a Rolex watch on the on the beach. He never got it back. Some little kid with a sieve found it, you know, on the top. And this right here is catching all of this larvae. Uh, it, you can size your larvae to a nice range with all these sieves. I mean, we go from 18 microns up to, you know, four millimeter in every gradation. So as you're doing larvae, you might use a 40 micron, a 53 micron, a 50, whatever, a 74 or 75, you know, they're all kind of different, a 90, a 110, all the way up to when I am getting ready to set, I want them retaining on a 210 micron screen. Uh, I, I kind of cheated today because I had a bunch of 200s and a bunch of 210s and I, I took all of them out. I took all the 200s out because if I put them back in the conical, they definitely would have set in the conicals over the weekend. So that happened to me last spawn. So I, I took them out on two, 200, but I separated the 210s from the 200s because I, I, I'm, I'm interested to see if there is a difference between the 200s and the 210s when it comes to uh, to, to setting there. So that's a, a screen. Let me see what else I can show you. 
uh, I don't want to bore anybody, but I think, uh, so that's that. And so, yeah, I'll show, I'll share that. Um, so let me share this. I should have made a slideshow, uh, but I didn't. So there's this picture. So, you know, I, what I do is I, 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 I drain all of the conicals down uh, and I've been labeling them when I put them back by size. So if I, today, what I did was I had uh, two tens, two hundreds, one eighties in the bucket like this, doop, doop, doop. And, and what you can do is you can, you can toss these buckets back and forth to get an even suspension. You take, a sample from them and you count them on a counting, that's what's called a Sedgwick rafter counting chamber. And if everyone, if anyone wants to learn how to do it, make sure you, well, you don't actually need to bring your reading glasses because you're doing it under a microscope and you can, you can uh, focus the microscope to your eyesight, no matter what it is. Uh, and we can teach you how to count larval cells. So a whole bunch of spat folks have been counting cells like mad and it's been kind of fun. So they're in the buckets and it, if this were larvae in the bucket, which it is, and it looks that dark, you know you have a ton of larvae. So you have to dilute it or else you're gonna be counting like mad. So we've been filling up the bucket to 10 liters, tossing it back and forth, pulling one liter out, putting it in a bucket, fill that up to 10 liters. So we have a 10, we have a one order magnitude dilution. So whatever's in here, let's say it was 20 million in the bucket and you took one liter out, put it in the bucket, filled it up to 10 and took a sample of that. We take a one milliliter pipette sample, put it on our counting chamber. If, it, if you count it under the microscope and you get 200, there's 2 million in the bucket. And that means there's 20 million total. So that's how we do it. If I give you a sample of this, you would have to count 2000 larvae swimming around. And so I went to coffee and you're like an hour and a half later, still counting these things. And we don't kill our larvae, they're swimming around like mad. You have to do this really fast or else uh, you have to kill the larvae to count them. You don't kill your larvae, do you, Barley? Uh, yeah, I shoot them with a little, I give them a little alcohol, dose yeah. of alcohol oh, you to do. slow them down. Oh, yeah. you give them alcohol. You don't give them iodine and kill them. You just give them alcohol to get them, get them a little sloppy drunk and, and slow and, down. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's interesting. See, I learned something every day. So we don't like to kill our larvae. And the I learned in grad school. You know, you give them a drop of iodine, and it, they're all now. Now the whole the whole thing is is, is sepia tone and a bunch of dead, you know, larvae. Yeah. And I don't like doing that. But now I just learned alcohol so do you use johnny walker or what do you use good old iso my buddy iso <laughs> oh okay isopropyl so yeah. so that's funny because i mean if you were using stolichnaya you're not allowed to do that anymore now that there's an embargo on anything that has yeah. to yeah wow alcohol well that's an that's news to me and I, that's why i love doing these forums because i learn something every time uh and that's fascinating. Oh, so I'll share this. This is just a, uh, I'll do this, I do this. I'm learning again, now I'm learning how to do it. Yeah, so here's here's one of our SPAC guys and, and he's uh, under the microscope on here. That's a Sedgwick grafter counting chamber. It holds, here's another uh, kind of a one on the side. It's got a little berm all around it. You're, the theory of a Sedgwick rafter is actually, no matter what you put in there, when you put a cover slip on it, it only holds a milliliter. Now we don't do that either because you know if you just throw whatever you want on there and put a cover slip, you're just squishing everything that doesn't fit in the in, in the levee out through uh, you know, and, and so we don't do that. We put in one milliliter sample, kind of. Sp spread it out so that there's no air bubbles or, or voids and put it on the, on the, on the microscope. It's got a mechanical, it's got a, a, a mechanical stage. So it goes back and forth. You sign And when you look under there, you're going to see a grid 
and and you you count all of this all of the larvae in that it, it, in the entire chamber. So there's a whole bunch of grids in there, and we use a a, a little counting. I call it a tally whacker. Click 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 click. So you don't have to remember. You just set it on zero. Every time you see a larvae, you click it, click, 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 and then you look at it and, and it'll, and if you do those counts, uh, you know, a couple times and take an average, you'll get a pretty, pretty close uh, uh, idea of how many, obviously it's not exact. It doesn't need to be exact. It needs to be just, you know, within a certain kind of thing there. Uh, oh, I don't, I wonder if I can call this up. I'm going to try to call this up. Um, let me see if I can, oh, what? I got a commercial. Oh, I see. No, this is something else. I'm going to skip ad. Let me go back here and uh, share this. Hold on. Share screen. Uh, is it there? Oh, no, wait. Share screen. Is that, are you seeing larvae? Not yet. Okay, hold on. Uh, hold on. Let me stop this. Hold on. Uh, let me get, this is kind of a cool, uh, okay, hold on a second. Share screen. Uh, uh, how do I sh find your hatchery? Share screen. Do you see larvae now? No? No. Uh, come on, how do I share this cool little video that Rory made? Um, oh, do, 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 uh, iPhone, iPad, I'm here, preview. Huh. Oh, I know why. I got to put it on my desktop, don't I? I don't know if I can do that. Uh, there's a, uh, I'll, I'll email everybody out. I don't want to bore anybody be, with the fact that I don't know what I'm doing with this particular one. Uh, it's a video that, how oh, come on, I would like to share this. Uh, uh, let me see if I can do this. Ah, hold on. Uh, stop share. Start share, share screen. Ah, now can you see it? Okay, got Larvae it. Larvae swimming around? Yep. Okay, hold on. Let me start it over again and go big. Now you got, uh, go big. Now you got the whole thing? Yes? Yes. Okay, so here's some nice footage that Rory made for us. Straight hinge villager, resting larvae and swimming larvae. They all have, oh, I'm going to tell you a funny story in a minute about counting. Well, I love this. Swing your partner, do -si do He's got, they're all looking like little clams, look like little clams. This is 10 day old larvae. Nice, beautiful larvae. 13 day, here's the eye spot. We'll talk about the eye spot in a minute. Little dot, a black dot. I love this footage here because here's swimming larvae. And look at this guy doing search crawl behavior. He's got his foot out. He's crawling along this culch and really sampling it and testing it like a snail. And then here's your shell chip with a little oyster set on it. And some that are still swimming around trying to make a decision. This guy looks like he just did it. Now that, that's, a, that's a cool video. I love that video. Uh, where am I? I'm gonna uh, escape. Where, I wanna escape. Where am I? I'm trying to get back to me now. How do I? Oh, here we go. Um, come on. Ah, hold on. Are we, are we still sharing? Oh, there we go. 
Ah, here we go. So stop share. Whew. I'm back. Am I back? Everyone saw that video? I want yeah. to show you one other quick, cool little, is this it? Where is it? No, that's not it. Uh, yeah, this. Uh, let me see if I can share one last thing, and then we're going to talk about just a couple other little uh, share screen. And I sent this out on the email. Can you see that? Yes. So I went to this Lyoga thing and Barley was there and whatnot. And I, I had this thing on my phone and I was showing it to Marty over at Ice. He's from the Ice Slip Hatchery and looking at this. And it's, it's like, is that really the heart beating? I mean, I never saw that in a larvae before. And I never thought that the heart beat like that. But he's like, yeah, that's the heart. How long have you been doing this? I, I, it was the first time I ever saw footage of, uh, 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 of a, a larvae with a heart. I know where the heart is on, a, on an oyster when I'm eating it, but it doesn't ever look like it's beating like that. Uh, but everyone's telling me it's the heart. So that's kind of cool. Now, what you're seeing here, uh, you, can, you can't really make out, but the, the part that looks like the clam larvae is right in here. And this is all just post-metamorphic set, gill structure, the gut, apparently the heart. you got this ciliated... Uh, 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 mantle laying down shell every day. Uh, it's really quite spectacular. Uh, you can you can come to the marine center. You see that this whole leading edge is is just living soft tissue, and it's moving and and doing its thing. And that right there, it kind of hiccuped, and you just see all these things going on inside. And what they're doing is filtering. And this, they use their uh, they use their ciliated gill lamellae as a conveyor belt for moving particles up and into the mouth and the digestive glands and and into the gut. Uh, it's it's really quite amazing that these little critter, critters, you know, th this is only this is a month old oyster, and. Uh, and it's already that that well developed, and you can still see through it, which is also kind of cool. It's it's that developed, but it's still so thin and small that uh, th that you can see through it. So now, just a couple things, uh, and then we can open it up for discussion if you want. A um, couple interesting things happen to me when I'm doing a drain down. This is collecting all the larvae. We collect all the swimming larvae and we usually never look at what was on the cone because it's usually dead. We just throw it away. Now, as you get later on, I've always looked at the cone when they've gotten to be, you know, 12, 11, 10 days old, just to, just to make sure I'm not throwing everything away. Well, today when I was collecting everything and getting ready to set those 200 gallon conicals when I drained them down and I looked back down in the bottom, I saw a big mass down at the very bottom and it sure looked like larvae. So I, I collected all the cones and it was about half the larvae. And I figured, oh, well, boy, I just, I, this stuff all died. And I looked under the microscope and none of it was dead. It was all fine. And, uh, it's just a lesson to be careful at the end of your drain downs that you don't just, you know, throw everything on the cone away without looking at it, because I would have literally thrown away about 10 million setting oyster larvae. But it was the first time that I ever did that, that I had virtually everything alive. I mean, normally I see a mixture and it's like, what am I going to do with this stuff? I, I'll, I'll put it in a separate thing because I'm not going to mix it with my prime larvae it's it's got dead stuff and ciliates and 
This time it was just like everything was alive. I kind of couldn't believe it. It was the first time that there was so much and it was all perfect. And, and we said it and uh, it was just like, wow, good thing I looked uh, and just didn't you know, do what I do every other drain down, which is just, eh. no, it's actually not true. This last set of uh, this last cohort of oysters, I was looking at the cone and every time I looked at it, everything was dead. It's like, why do I even bother doing this? And today I did it again and it was all alive. So it's just a kind of a funny little lesson of, of being careful at the end, not to just throw everything away. Now, I have a question for anyone that wants to answer it. As these, one of the diagnostics, and we're gonna talk a lot about this next month, is you're getting ready for larvae to undergo metamorphosis. And one of the reasons why in the hatchery you wanna be prepared is, it's kind of a pain if it sets all over your gear. And now you've got to, all your stuff, especially oysters, because the difference between oysters, and again, we're going to, I don't want to give too much away uh, for next month, but oysters are very different from all of the other species that we grow, because when they metamorphose, they cement to stuff. I mean, clams don't cement. They've got a foot, they keep their foot and they burrow in. Scallops have the ability to swim and they've got a, a, a bissel thread that is like spidey man that sticks to things. But oysters, when they metamorphose, they, they literally lay down a blob of Portland. <laughs> and this, that's it for life. Whatever they did, if they, if they cemented to the, to, to the toenail of a, uh, uh, of a seagull well tough luck that's it's it's that's where it's going to be uh so um last last the v valentine's day spawn on the friday so call it like today uh when i was taking them out i put the 200 micron ones back in the conicals and on monday when i drained them down there was a whole bunch set all over the conicals and I got them off. I collected them. I scotch brighted them off and I, you know, I did all I had to do, but this time I didn't do that. I, I took them out. Uh, the diagnostics for, for oysters are the size. So, you know, 210 is a magic number. It really is. That's it. If you take them out at 210, they're practically setting on your bucket before you even put them in the set tanks. They, that, that's a nice size. Uh, the presence of an eye spot, the black dot, the presence of a foot and them literally crawling around, all of that is saying these suckers are ready to set. Now, what's also funny about when I left them over the weekend in the conicals when I was cleaning everything out. The one thing that I don't clean very well whenever I'm cleaning my conicals is the heater, the heater cord and uh, and the, the, the little probe for the heater. And they were completely set all over all of those things. It was just like 36 grit sandpaper and they love biofilm again we're going to talk about it next next month but they love the slimy coat of stuff and so you know if you don't clean really well they go to it like a magnet uh my question to anybody that wants to answer it is what is that black eye spot what is that nobody it's not in any of the literature i have a suspicion i know what it is but any thoughts on that the black eye spot Barley, any thought? I, I always thought it was photosensitive, a photosensitive organ, and that they they actually I uh, thought they chose choose to set in the dark areas, right? Well, that's that's an interesting thought. Uh, if they there there is, you know, again, I didn't I didn't call up any of last year's PowerPoint, which has a discussion on all of these things like the, the propensity of larvae liking to set in the dark, like cover, cover your set tanks uh, because they will set better in the dark. The thought being that, you know, dark might mean hidden 
and it's kind of evolutionarily uh, plus. The interesting thing for me is I got my master's degree looking at uh, what was going on in search crawl behavior and in metamorphosis. And search crawl behavior, there's a lot of studies that was looking at the neurotransmitters that were playing a role in, in uh, search crawl behavior. And L-DOPA and serotonin were studied a lot to induce this. Now, what's, it, there was also a study that looked at what, what is in biofilm, and they found what was called a dopamimetic bacteria in biofilm. So I'm a, I'm a proponent of the fact that they're using neurotransmitter uh, cues based on dopamines, okay? I'm fine with that. I just don't use the chemicals anymore. Okay, I used to actually get L-dopa and epinephrine and serotonin and GABA aminobutyric, GABA aminobutyric, gamma aminobutyric acid, and all these things, and and you had to wear gloves because you could end up, uh, you know, with Ken Kesey and other folks, of uh, you know, going on the road and writing beat poetry if you got too much of it through your pores of your skin. It opens up doors that might have wanted to stay shut, uh, you know. But what's interesting about all that is that melanin, which is a black pigment, is a precursor of dopamines. So melanin biochemically is part of that dopaminergic pathway. So it's kind of interesting. It makes me think that that I spot is a concentration of melanin that is aiding in their inducement of search crawl behavior. And nobody is, you know, to dissect the I spot out, melt it down and test it out is a daunting challenge for science. And it hasn't, as far as I know, been done. So it's kind of, you know, and, and I'll tell you right now, having dealt with my, my high school intern that's been at the hatchery every Monday and Friday because he's homeschooled, uh, don't give a high school student that challenge to dissect the eye spot out of a larvae, melt it down and tell me exactly what it is because they'll definitely burn an ulcer in themselves trying to figure it out even if they're homeschooled. So it's, that's just intriguing. And what's also intriguing is this, oysters cement. So that decision is pretty terminal. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty lasting choice. So they better get it right. So their need to undergo search crawl, to, to sample their, their, environment to get to the right thing. If they set in a noxic black ooze, they're going to die. You know, they're not going to make it. If they set on structure and if it's structure that they like and it's good, then that seems to be good. There's been studies that say that if you, uh, if you put in oyster bath water, so in other words, you take adult oysters put it in the water so they respire, they give off a signal because oysters, and I love this in the literature, oysters are gregarious. Yeah, they all hang out at oyster bars. <laughs> they're gregarious. No, then they make oyster reefs. Okay, how do they do that? Well, maybe they're queuing their larvae to come in. It's like, here we are, it's all good. Power in numbers, uh, bing. So, Clams, I've never seen an eye spot ever in a larvae. Why? They're not. They, or, clams will set in pretty much anything. I mean, you'll find clams in anoxic black ooze. Why? You pull them out of anoxic black ooze. They're stained black. You can't even get the black off of the shell. How, come, how can they live there? Well, they've got a siphon. They stick it out of that and they feed above it. They don't really care. I mean, unfortunately for... Uh, 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 steamer clams, Maya arenaria, they don't care either. And they're the only invertebrate known to actually get a form of cancer. 
They, there's hematopoietic neoplasia in Maya arenaria. It's clam leukemia from clams that are like in the Raritan Bay, you know, because they're immersed, uh, they, they're, they're surrounded, their bodies are surrounded by toxins and they can get leukemia. Uh, now they're not, they're feeding above it, but they can tolerate living in it, but they didn't know that they were living in, you know, toxic waste in some places. Sorry, Bayonne, I didn't mean to diss you wherever you are, but uh, it's just kind of interesting. So I thought, well, scallops actually, they, they've kind of got a, pre a, a, a more serious prerequisite for setting. They, it isn't eelgrass, by the way. Eelgrass just happens to be a wonderful setting medium, a natural, wonderful setting medium. Is it required? If it was required, Barley and I would never be able to grow scallops ever because it's not like we had to go get eelgrass, put it in our set tanks to set scallops. They love plastic more than they love uh, eelgrass. It's just that how would you... How would you set that up in nature? You would get every Boy Scout and Girl Scout and every broom from Ace Hardware and have them just push the broom handle into the sediments and have them set all over the broom because they would love that. It's the only problem is it would only really work one season. Eelgrass was like the broom and like a grass would just be mowed down every winter and new come up. So you get fresh bio, bio, film on the new grass is perfect medium. Does it, is it required for scalps? No, they, they'll, they'll settle on any good medium. So I thought, well, how come they don't have an eye spot? And it turns out if you look really closely, they do. Have you ever noticed that Barley? It took me the longest time. Next time you're growing scallop larvae, as they're reaching metamorphosis, look really closely on high mag and you will see a tiny, tiny eye spot you're mute that's cool yeah i didn't know that i didn't that either until time. you know i was just intrigued by the <clears throat> fact it's like well you would think that scallops would really kind of want to undergo a little bit of test driving and maybe it's maybe it's my own really hoping to see an eye spot this season but uh, ground truth me on that next time you have yeah, well. We actually had scallops spawning today. We're going to spawn scallops Monday. They they set the temperature up two degrees higher, and they were keeping them cool. They were at like 65. They put them in water that was 67, and you got little Epcot centers going, the little bubbles. Uh, so I think they're ready to – we're going to try them on Monday. So. Nice. So, so I think that's what the eye spot is, uh, the size – the foot, all of those are diagnostics, and that and and that's kind of a, and that's all I really had for today. If anyone had any questions or comments or anything like that, I've really been enjoying an open forum of of just discussion. But keep in mind, part of this open forum is under the assumption that you've relooked at the PowerPoint from last year because that has all the details. I didn't want to get into you know intense boring details when it's all there you can bore yourself at a at another time yeah <laughs> how's that that's all good great thank you excellent now keep in mind that uh we're we're, we're moving along quickly so feel free to come by the marine center we're there monday wednesday fridays in the morning till about noon or one or something uh and and you know, get reconnected. Everything is good. We're gonna. We're we're really hoping for a glorious season. And you too, Barley. The best of luck for everything. That's great. Looking forward Thanks. to it. We need it. Good. Good. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. It's going to be a Thank beautiful you. day. I think to the Sunday. So. <laughs> great. Thank you very much. Good. Okay. See you out there.